irrespective of the organizations, irrespective of where in the value chain, be it in the textile industry or outside the textile industry, we've been, um, as we've dealt with different problems that the COVID-19 crisis has thrown at us, one of the larger questions that we've been asking ourselves and all our partners and suppliers and vendors um, is how do we keep the sustainability agenda alive, right? And one of the primary concerns that, for example, from a CIAN point of view that we've been hearing from um, a lot of the industry stakeholders is that with the primary focus for most of us, not just in India, but across the world, uh, being survival in terms of the business, in terms of holding on to our jobs, um, how do we ensure that sustainability remains a priority now more than ever, perhaps, um, and ensure that while there might be other business priorities, the sustainability agenda is not something that shifts uh, in, at the bottom of the uh, priority list, right? So that's a conversation that we will have with Abhishek. Uh, we're hoping it, this to be a very informal, casual, yet a serious conversation in terms of the topic that we are going to discuss. Uh, so Abhishek, if I may get started and uh, start with, as far as we understand the head of sustainability role, right? As somebody who's leading the sustainability initiative in an organization. And of course, like you mentioned about um, your active participation as an individual and as an organization and in uh, industry bodies like Sustainable Apparel Coalition, the head of sustainability is perhaps one of the most critical roles within the organization, right? Um, talk to us about how a typical week has been for you as the head of sustainability for Arvind uh, in the last three to four months. And how does it compare with uh, what your week used to look like in the pre-COVID uh, days? Certainly. Uh, so, so I mean, essentially, uh, I think uh, uh, everybody has like different uh, uh, dimensions to the sustainability role in terms of organizations. Uh, preferences and goals, but at Arvin, uh, if you see what uh, our sustainability department and, and my time uh, is how it is spent, we I can broadly classify it into four maybe equal size uh, buckets, uh, where the primary uh, role is, uh, of course, related to sustainable operations, where right. how we are able to drive sustainability th throughout our operations, be it in terms of uh, renewable energy or uh, water recycling or uh, judicious use of sustainable chemistry uh, sure. and, and uh, raw materials, recycling, waste management. So that's perhaps, uh, I would say, the largest uh, part of the role and number one uh, part. Second is, uh, of course, which is uh, not, not very common, uh, Arvind as a company is also into uh, into sustainable farming. So sustainable farming of cotton. Uh, primarily cotton. We are also trying to grow some other uh, raw materials, but uh, cotton uh, we have integrated uh, as, as a vertical integration. We have gone up to the farm level where we are working with more than 80,000 farmers and, right. and a team, uh, team of 180 people of extension staff in, in different states and districts of India, which are working with farmers on, on, on contract farming of organic cotton, regenerative organic cotton and better cotton. So that's uh, that's probably at, at, at number two. At number three uh, uh, is uh, the innovation agenda. So I'm also, uh, as part of sustainability, also trying to drive sustainable innovation uptake um, in 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 the in the in the business and in the manufacturing. So which cuts across uh, different uh, parts. So the innovation could be uh, in in the in the in the technologies that we deploy for manufacturing, be it. Uh, dyeing, finishing, or the way a particular product is made. Innovation could be in, in agriculture. Innovation could be in the business model or on the digital side. So uh, there's a, um, that's how we engage with different uh, startups, different existing technology providers who are coming with new innovations. And we engage quite closely with, with Fashion for Good, as you know, which is um, Innovation uh, Accelerator and also CIF, uh, which brings in uh, innovation. So that's, that's the third uh, bucket. And uh, the fourth one is all the external uh, stakeholders and initiatives and engagement uh, with them. So 
which is organizations like say, SEC, ZDHC, uh, uh, interacting with different different customers, meeting their requirements, and also uh, domestic stakeholders like like governments and, and any other regulatory agencies or trade bodies uh, within India and globally. So broadly, I would say like these four uh, four parts in in uh, not not in uh, particular order of uh, importance, but I would say uh, they're in in the order of time uh, that that gets devoted towards uh, in these individual. Right, fantastic. Um, and I remember all the conversations that we've had over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, one of the key uh, discussions points for us have obviously been how do we you know, ensure sustained support for the cotton farmers. And you spoke about the initiative that you do on the uh, cotton farming side, and we'll come to that in a little bit, uh, Abhishek. Uh, but very quickly, for those of you who are listening in, uh, please feel free to send in your questions via chat. Um, and I'm going to request my team to pick up the questions and we'll, st we'll keep asking Abhishek as we go through the conversation. Um, but coming back to um, you, Abhishek, um, when the, when the lockdown began and when the businesses started shutting down and the operations started shutting down, could you give us a sense of from the role that you have as the head of sustainability and as Arvind, what were some of the key concerns around the sustainability agenda, right? Both in the short term as well as, as, well as long term, would be good for us to kind of set the context for the conversation as we go ahead in terms of what were the concerns that you were uh, hoping, expecting will probably come up in the short term or the long term? Sure. So uh, uh, as uh, lockdown hit us, uh, not, not with a great uh, sort of notice period. So there was a lot of things that we needed to take care of uh, immediately, which was like safe uh, shutting down of operations uh, because Textile operations is a, is a continuous process, and we do have utilities, which are uh, like even if you say textile production, it is uh, mostly in batches, but in the utility uh, continues 24/7. So safe shutting down of of, of boilers, of ETPs, and and uh, all all the utilities. We have massive solar plants on our rooftops, so worrying about. Uh, what happens to that uh, that power that gets generated and and and, and uh, uh, things like that? So the first priority immediately was to ensure that uh, all the plants and machinery is is uh, shut down in a safe manner and and they are, they are protected from from any other uh, any any consequences uh, due to a drastic uh, closure uh, of operations. Uh, so the immediate uh, few days uh, were, were spent in that, but uh, later on, yeah, we, we started uh, thinking about uh, the communities and, and the stakeholders which would be uh, most impacted. And uh, since the cotton uh, procurement and cotton harvest is, has just ended, but a lot of post-harvesting uh, uh, operations like cotton processing and in some cases, procurement of cotton from farmers was also still pending. And uh, so that, that became uh, one major concern in terms of how to take care of, of the farming community, which gets uh, disconnected with the industry because of, uh, because of the immediate uh, lockdown. So, uh, so the cotton was on the way. There's some cotton in the gins, uh, which was uh, uh, in, in the processing stage and some was processed but not transported. So that, that uh, immediately came in as, as one of the uh, other concerns. On, on the third uh, uh, dimension, it was also uh, about uh, our workforce because uh, uh, besides uh, uh, across all the, all the facilities in India uh, and the lockdown was in India at that time, not in Ethiopia. So major worry was Indian operations where we deploy, uh, where we employ more than 30,000 uh, workforce right. uh, across different factories. And as you know, uh, textile is, is manpower intensive and, and more, many of the, the uh, most of the workforce is, is coming from, uh, from the, from the government community. So, and, right. and especially when we talk about garmenting, these, these are largely the women, uh, women workforce. So we immediately tried to establish uh, contact with all the workforce to, to see uh, what are their immediate uh, requirements, how, how they are doing, uh, what, uh, is, is there any immediate challenge 
uh, to them and we started making plan on how we stay with them uh, in continuous touch, how we are able to uh, meet their needs. Some of them wanted to get transported back to their hometowns, uh, people who were not, not uh, from the local area. So trying to arrange all of that as soon as that became feasible. We do have some residential facilities uh, for workers. So trying to, to manage uh, those uh, so that they still continue to uh, operate uh, while, while uh, everything else uh, was shut. So, so primarily these these few things uh, like kept us occupied uh, for 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 long uh, during the initial uh, part of the shutdown. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Abhishek. Uh, so, if if you were to um, from somebody who's on the front lines of you know uh, crafting, shaping, driving the sustainability agenda at a large organization like um, Arvind, and also having to influence that whole sustainability philosophy or the whole transition towards a circular economy uh, from an industry or from an ecosystem standpoint. Um, the one thing that we've always been very curious to know is, in your view as somebody who's been on the front lines, um, how has this crisis impacted the sustainability agenda in itself, right? Because a lot of the focus, and like you said, the immediate focus was in ensuring the safety of you know your immediate uh, workforce but of course also about how do you continue to uh, provide uh, supplements or support for the communities that you're part of or that are part of your business and your sphere of work but talk to us a little bit about how the industry's sustainability agenda has been impacted by the COVID crisis sure so I think uh, it would uh, it would be prudent to say that uh, work across different departments and across different functions has got impacted. So first of all, uh, like it's not only uh, sustainability which is probably uh, seeing uh, the impact, but I think everybody's work has got impacted. So whether you are part of a, a finance team or a, a, an HR team or, or any, any particular work stream or any particular, if you are into product development, if you're a designer. So in textile industry, everything has got impacted because as many of the other, other retail, uh, textile retail has been probably equally or even worse impacted because of sudden closure of, of stores and textile being a non-essential commodity, it was not uh, allowed even uh, for, for selling online. So all the revenue stream suddenly stopped. So uh, payments uh, got stuck across the board uh, where, where uh, different supply chain payments were not moving uh, in the supply chain. Uh, and, and, and that's immediately led to fr uh, budget freeze across different functions that are across different different departments of course sustainability uh, is no no different so that was a short term um, uh, sort of impact that that we saw that immediately everything had come to stand still as as with uh, with everything else but uh, i think as as we saw recovery started happening uh, early may or, or mid may at least in india with uh, with factories being allowed to operate and then with some phase-wise opening of markets and then the products being classified as as uh, non uh, as uh, sort of non-essential goods were also allowed to sell and transport. So there are we have also uh, started uh, uh, seeing that different uh, initiatives have also got uh, restored. So, for example, just to give an example of uh, of from the farming. So we had uh, we as you know we we've been uh, working with farmers on on organic farming initiatives and we expand to certain extent every year uh, by adding more number of farmers and and uh, and to bring in more cotton and the sustainable cotton in india so so the, the, it was an immediate fear that uh, what uh, whether we'll be able to go ahead with the expansion plans and and how those would be impacted but by by the time and the time it, it came for expansion, which happens normally during May and June, when uh, just before the cotton sowing season, so we were right. able to still expand our number of farmers by by more than 20 25 percent uh, for this year, which was a very encouraging sign because we still saw that the demand for sustainable cotton uh, 
uh, was uh, was not hit as much as uh, it was for the overall business. So, what what we are seeing also as a, as a reaction uh, from our customers is uh, uh, that people are have come to a certain baseline over years of hard work in terms of sustainability. So they've reached a certain percentage of sustainable fibers, or we have reached a certain percentage of renewable energy or or water recycling, so people are not 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 uh, uh, wanting to give up on that baseline so easily. So people still want to right. hold on to the positions where they have reached. The expense of further building upon on those to increase, uh, say, a proportion of of uh, sustainable cotton or a proportion of renewable energy, might right. might take a pause uh, for the interim. But we are again uh, seeing that there is still good commitment especially for the companies who have integrated sustainability well into their operations and in their strategy. Right. So I think uh, there they have been casualties, but it's mostly where you were doing sustainability as a, as a one-off uh, project or as a one-off initiative and right. not like a well thought through uh, strategy. Right. Fantastic. Um, and, and I want to pick up on one of the things that you mentioned and that was really interesting because um, and this is one of the things that um, I kept constantly uh, hearing back from you in all our conversations the last couple of months. It was really refreshing for us to hear that from an Arvind point of view, uh, Abhishek was that, uh, you know, obviously everyone knows that there's been a huge erosion in from an economic value point of view, right? Because, and this is not just in India, not just in our industry, but it's been worldwide. Um, but I guess when we talk about how do you keep the sustainability agenda alive, and when we talk about it in the context of the transition towards a circular economy, we don't just focus on the economic or the environmental aspects alone. We also talk about the social aspects, right? And um, one of the things that we heard from you on, uh, because of the nature of the business that you are in and where you are in the value chain, one of the things that um, and I know that was really pulling you down, uh, I, I think the conversation was sometime in April where with all the cancellation of orders, the differing of payments, the delaying of payments, uh, people reneging on contracts that they had placed in the, in the pre-COVID uh, days as well, that you were committed to uh, honor some of these contracts, right? But despite that, largely across the industry, we've also seen a huge erosion in trust between different stakeholders in the value chain. Um, talk to us a little bit about what Arvind's philosophy has been in terms of ensuring how you work with, uh, worked with over the last three, four months in making sure that you're not just obviously thinking about how do you manage the cash flows, which, which is it's a foregone conclusion that it's been a, it's taken a huge hit for uh, everyone across the board. But how have you been, or what has your thinking been in terms of ensuring that the relationships that you have so painfully built over the years and nurtured over the years across the value chain, what is the thinking behind it? How have you kept those relationships alive? What are some of the ways in which you've been able to extend support or um, give them some kind of a relief over the last three to four months? Sure. So uh, I think one advantage uh, there that we had was that Arvind is a 90 year old company and has been through uh, multiple crises. Uh, Arvind was established in 1931 and we've seen many, many uh, domestic and, and global crises over the last 90 years. So there was a certain level of uh, uh, preparedness or, or a certain level of uh, uh, I would say cushion uh, that that such companies uh, build uh, due to their past uh, uh, history and, and operations and many of the clients that that we work with they, we've been working with them for 10 20 30 years or as long as those brands have existed uh, or have been buying from India so so right. our relationships uh, go go very deep but uh, even even given that uh, this is the this was a crisis which we have uh, not seen any anything to this uh, proportion and to this magnitude, and especially in the current generation. So, current generation of uh, of, uh, of of teams in our, our company or in, in 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 on the client side, 
and i think immediate reaction uh, for everyone wherever the, the stores uh, were getting closed or our operations were getting hit was to take a pause so everybody took a pause uh, to take stock of the situation where people said like hold on to whatever you are producing don't send any more and then then payments were also uh, getting stuck or stopped and and it was happening across the board so it was happening uh, across the uh, board and across the relationship so be it brand or a retailer or a manufacturer or a cotton producer or a cotton uh, uh, trader or a chemical supplier so every i think every supplier and buyer relationship was seeing these dynamics and I think it was uh, something which was needed uh, in terms of uh, uh, like to take a more calibrated action. So we saw that initial 15-20 days a month, everybody took a reassessment of their position that how much is the exposure, what is the impact, and then slowly we saw people coming to negotiating tables. So where people said, okay, this is what these are my dues uh, to you, and this is something which is in production. So we. We're trying to uh, arrive at a plan where uh, what what would happen to the goods which have been shipped, what would happen to the goods which were in production, and of course, there's uh, if 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 uh, somebody was uh, uh, who had just placed an order and we had not produced, so we were happy to accept cancellation for those as uh, without any recourse and, and so on. So I think there, there, was, uh, uh, there was a time when things were looking uh, bad, but since then uh, there has been improvement uh, slowly uh, uh, in, in, uh, across the board it, uh, again. So uh, unfortunately in some cases, uh, there have been companies who have gone uh, uh, bankrupt or who have uh, uh, filed for, for bankruptcy. And in such cases, they've been losses uh, that, that suppliers have to face. And in some, some cases, uh, the, the, the brand is still not honoring the payment commitments, even when they So there are exceptions uh, to the extent of 10, 15, 20%. But by and large, in 80% of the cases, we have uh, seen more amicable settlement of, of the situation uh, uh, with, with the relationships. It does take like take a hit. Uh, I think, uh, especially in the cases where there has not been any resolution. But uh, I think it, it depends on how you treat uh, the the the. If you are in a position of power, then how do you treat someone who's not in a position of power or who's not in a negotiating position? So how you treat basically your your supplier is is something. You, even if somebody is not making a say payment or canceling an order, there's a there's a uh, like there's a way to uh, to communicate and there's a way to negotiate, explain, and to see what what can be done uh, to mitigate uh, the impact as much as possible. So I think some of those things will still keep uh, the relations alive on how uh, we treat each other during during the crisis. But in some cases, the, of course, the relationships would be broken and uh, beyond repair. Right. Yeah, I can imagine that. Um, and um... And that's that's really critical. And the other thing that you were mentioning, Abhishek, which is um, when you were talking about what are those three, four things that takes up your typical day or a week uh, these days in the last three, four months as well as, uh, and something that we as CI have always loved to hear is your continued focus on innovation, right? So when we talk about um, in the context of how do you keep a sustainability agenda alive within an organization across the industry as well, um, we've been speaking about the importance of how organizations need to reimagine their products or services or offerings in general, um, but also how they reimagine businesses, right? Or what pivots they need to be making. So um, before we get into the specific part about uh, innovation, which we'll come to in a, in a very short time, help us with understanding what are some of the pivots or what are some of the ways in which your thinking has evolved as Arvind or as you as an individual and your team, which is driving the whole sustainability agenda at uh, Arvind, how has your thinking been evolving over the last three to four months in this whole drive towards keeping the sustainability agenda alive within your own organization, uh, which is such a significant mandate for you? Tell us about your evolution in the thinking at your end. 
Uh, I think uh, what what we have seen is uh, uh, that there is a very uh, powerful approach uh, of partnerships. So uh, what what we have seen also in terms of initiatives and in terms of different projects that we've been running, wherever we are partnering across the value chain. So either it could be uh, partnering with a with a with a brand for a particular initiative or partnering with say say. Uh, with an uh, organization like Organic Cotton Accelerator for organic farming, uh, accelerating the organic farming, or some of our innovation partnerships uh, with, with Fashion for Good. So I think the partnership uh, feature where, where things are done collectively, burden sharing is also done collectively, and also everybody gets benefited out of a certain initiative. So some of the, those initiatives we've seen, uh, that they're still running very strong. So there's still a lot of interest where, where people have taken pains to get uh, a few players in the industry together or at least two or three of us have come together to do something so there's a large interest uh, in in people to continue to run those partnerships and to expand those partnerships so i think it's a great learning uh, for us that uh, we should uh, we, we, we are now trying to see that how we partner with more like-minded uh, organizations in in every everything that we do, so so that that's I think one major uh, takeaway, and right. and, uh, and uh, I think also in in our industry it is something which is needed, uh, especially when we talk about sustainability and and some of the innovation which is uh, we always say it is pre competitive, but we will see very less uh, we still see very less collaboration and and partnerships, uh, especially. Uh, uh, horizontally, if you see within the same uh, tier, within the same uh, sort of supply base. So uh, I think uh, we would uh, strive for building more and more meaningful partnerships uh, with like-minded organizations in our sustainability agenda, so that we can drive right. things uh, uh, in a in a more uh, for, for more longevity in the initiatives. Fantastic, um, and Abhishek, I think while you speak about your continued emphasis and drive on innovation and looking for the right kind of partnership to build on your own uh, sustainability agenda and initiatives. Um, perhaps this would be a good time to talk about a couple of areas that uh, you believe could be great opportunities for those of uh, some of those who are listening in um, as an opportunity to collaborate with Arvind. Right? We spoke about the calls to action. So uh, for those of you who are listening in, um, one of the things uh, that Abhishek has been very kind and talked about is that he's going to indicate through this conversation very specific calls to action or areas where um, he would be looking to collaborate and partner with uh, some of you, most of you, or a lot of you. Um, so Abhishek, um, could you help us with what those two specific calls to action would be at this point in time? So, so, so uh, we, we have been uh, looking for, and I think there's more and more need uh, to go for uh, uh, new materials. And uh, uh, by new materials, it uh, doesn't mean like uh, entirely new, which is not being used, but it is either a alternate uh, raw material or a recycled material. So there's equal emphasis on finding alternatives to some of the popular, uh, current popular fibers, which are cotton, polyester, or viscose. So people are very keenly looking for alternate raw materials which are lower impact or uh, the recycled materials which could replace uh, these uh, raw materials uh, either proportionately or, or with some new uh, features or new properties. So, so that's a big uh, working area for us where we've been exploring different recycling uh, solutions for, for cotton and, and polyester and also alternate uh, raw materials like uh, uh, bamboo or banana fiber and to see how those raw materials uh, can be produced with the lower impact or, or whether they are lower impact in first place. So uh, I think that, that would be one, uh, one call to action where we, we would be happy to work with the, 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 uh, the uh, innovators uh, in this space or the companies in this space. Uh, and utilize. So, just to recap, you're looking for uh, potential partners, innovators in the space of new materials, alternate materials, which could also include recycled material as well, right? 
So um, I hope you you guys are listening in and making notes. Um, drop us a note if it is something that you're offering and that's the space that you're operating in. Uh, reach out to us and we'll make sure that uh, you'll connect up with uh, Abhishek and see how that partnership can potentially happen. Um, what would be the second one, uh, Abhishek? Yeah, so the second one on entirely uh, similar lines, I would say, is uh, related to fuels. So we are looking at uh, various uh, renewable fuels or waste uh, which can be used as fuel. So uh, I think it's uh, it, it's uh, needless to say that we all need to reduce our uh, greenhouse gas footprint or carbon footprint. And in that direction, we have been working uh, quite a lot on solar, wind, and some of the other conventional, uh, like non-conventional or conventional, uh, we can uh, say either way, in reducing our footprint of, uh, of uh, uh, carbon-based fuel. We right. managed to reduce to the extent of about 20%, but uh, we would be uh, certainly looking for to do more. So any, any ways and means to use renewable energy more effectively in textiles, or any alternate fuels, uh, whether it is uh, waste to energy or whether it is agriculture-based fuel. So, so that, that would be another big area for us. Fantastic. So the second one is an alternate fuels, which fundamentally is going to help Arvind in reducing the footprint from carbon-based fuels. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, okay, thank you so much for those. But uh, let me just take a pause here and look at some of the questions that are coming in from the audience side. And if I could pick one, um, there's one which links up with one of your call to actions, right? Which is, there's a question that's come in, which, uh, they're asking, how big do you think the industry in the upcycling or the recycling industry is going to be in India? And obviously, what is the potential for an upcycling or a recycling uh, uh, aspect in the industry in India? that uh, you see as an individual or as Arvind for that matter? Sure. So uh, talking specifically about recycling, so I think recycling of, of, uh, of textile waste or byproducts is already a very big uh, uh, industry and probably the biggest uh, of other uh, regions, I would say, in India. So a lot of uh, formal and informal recycling of different waste uh, streams that comes from textile production already happens uh, in India. But there's a need to uh, now look at it in terms of more value generation and converting it to upcycling. So right. how to bring back those material to the same input stream as, as we currently produce uh, fresh textile or fresh fabrics. So that is the key uh, to see because a lot of these projects, uh, these uh, waste streams are downcycled. So either you're using it for say mattress filling or you're using it to make ropes or you're using it to make uh, carpets or blankets, which are all, I think, fair uh, usages, but we also need to see how we can bring that uh, back to the original textile production uh, value chain. Right. And also, there's also uh, another big uh, uh, area is to look at used clothing. So traditionally, used clothing has not been a problem, uh, not been a huge problem in India, where uh, uh, Clothes have been uh, used uh, more often, I would say, in India than like every every piece of clothing has been used or worn more than average on an average. Uh, what is the global average of of this? So, uh, but uh, now we're seeing, uh, especially in the cities where people uh, don't have uh, uh, un the the clothes are not being used for for similar number of cycles. And they're they're not been places of uh, of giving those clothes after you have used or after it's not no longer useful to you. So there's right. a need for setting up a collection mechanism uh, of these used textile in India, which doesn't exist. So right. right now, most of the post-consumer waste recycling which happens is where the used clothing is coming from uh, from uh, US or Europe. So India is a very large importer of used clothing, which is uh, mainly then used for recycling or used as scrap uh, in different industries. And then it, it's a big hub in Panipat, which also recycle used clothing. Right. But I think uh, the used clothing collection system is not, not very, uh, very much in existence in India. So there's a huge uh, need uh, to do that, especially in the large cities. 
and 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 to put that back also uh, as a recycling tool. Fantastic. Um, and this is this is a follow up question uh, which again came up from the audience. So I'm going to pick that up. Um, what do you think is going to be the future of rental and retail in the post COVID world, especially as you talk about the whole uh, mindset or the worry around contact and the fact that you know the clothing uh, exchanges multiple hands? Um, do you think it's going to be affected in the short term to medium term? Um, and obviously, what is the what is the value or the, what is the future that you see for rental and retail in India? So I would see uh, these two separately, so rental and resale as two separate and distinct uh, uh, aspects and especially for rental, I would say the jury was still out on whether renting is a more sustainable option or not because uh, a lot of people have debated that if you rent a, a garment uh, for five or six or ten times, then entire carbon footprint in to and fro shipping and dry cleaning or cleaning that each time would be more than uh, what you end up saving and normally there was also a tendency that was observed uh, especially uh, from some data from us that uh, the garment uh, which was deployed for rental was not only uh, rented say five or six times or seven times at max and not throughout its complete life life cycle because once the garment was losing its sheen it was no longer uh, uh, suitable for renting out. So I would say that uh, rental per se, uh, there's still not uh, enough data or clarity around whether it has lower environmental footprint or environmental impacts than, than buying and using a new garment uh, a few 10, 15, 20 times. So, so that, that, that is uh, something uh, which again would certainly be more challenging now in, in post-COVID uh, world, uh, whether uh, where you would need to deploy even further more uh, sanitation uh, before the rented garment changes hand from one person to another. For right. resale, uh, definitely resale is uh, something which is uh, uh, which is definitely considered to be sustainable, and data also shows uh, that reselling or mending and then reselling the garment certainly uh, does does a good service in terms of reducing the environmental impact and there's already a huge impact on, on the reselling industry. So, uh, because we used to also get a lot of uh, warm clothes uh, from Europe uh, to India and use them for recycling. We were not doing reselling, but similar thing is uh, we are seeing in both uh, recycling and reselling space where a lot of these collection programs have stopped uh, by municipalities and by different agencies because of fear of uh, residual infections in, in, the, in the clothes uh, given by the users. So that, that, that would certainly uh, uh, take, a, take a medium term hit, but I think long term uh, reselling has emerged as a very good and, and potential solution uh, for, for managing the clothes that one no longer needs uh, because of uh, size, fit or, or style issues. So, so I think that that would again uh, flourish once we are past this uh, this time. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I want to just quickly go back to um, you know what you were saying about uh, recycling and one of the things that uh, CI, for example, that we realize is that um, one of the significant reasons why the adoption of uh, managing your pre-consumption or post-consumption waste, and I'm making a very blanket statement uh, for the for the um, entire industry as such, is the two aspects of aggregation and segregation, right? So uh, for those of you who are listening in, this is actually one of the interesting projects that we are actually, um, one of them is on ground for the last two weeks, and the other one is uh, expected to go um, into the execution phase very soon, but that's something that we're working with uh, your colleagues uh, at Arvind Abhishek, where we're putting together potentially a, a process uh, innovation, for lack of better words, where we are helping to address the that significant problem of segregation and aggregation, right? So, but of course, um, like you rightly pointed out, when you think of it in the context of rental and resale as well, and when you think about 
putting together a logistic network or framework in mind which talks about the logistics involved of shipping pre consumption or post consumption waste across a larger geographical spread then uh, we also need to be very conscious of the negative footprint that comes in from the logistics as well right and so yes that's definitely one thing that we'll we'll factor that into uh, the framework or the methodology that we are piloting out with your colleagues but thank you so much for bringing that up um i want to now shift gears and talk about when when we and this is something that we've constantly spoken about abhishek where um and not just arvin but everyone in the industry believes that when we talk about making credible tangible progress on towards circularity or keeping the sustainability agenda alive we all collectively have agreed that it is not something that one organization or one team can drive right it's such a huge vast complex problem that there is obviously space for anyone and everyone to participate and join hands to make that progress together right so um it's it's important that we speak about the significance of collaboration so um i i think what the audiences would love to understand is from an arvin point of view talk to us about um where you feel that are one or two areas in the in that collaboration in the un, under these space of collaboration where um as an industry we are lacking what are one or two areas where we should be collaborating and what are those reasons or why we think those collaborations are not happening which are so critical in keeping that sustainability agenda alive yeah i think a uh, uh, lot of collaborations as uh, i was speaking about have come on the input side of it so if you see uh, there are like uh, uh, a lot of organizations working together on the farming side on uh, on on the technology side on the dyeing side uh, in the chemistry space uh, uh, but i think the key uh, part that is lacking is again coming back to the waste so the waste management is a place which is highly uh, uh, desegregated and also uh, happening uh, more disjointly in in pockets so uh, there is no not much uh, collaboration that we see right now in waste management and recycling space Right. Where, uh, where there is still a lot of opportunities to uh, to join hands to work collectively to have to have or to build some of these systems, uh, especially for India, uh, I would say because in the in the in 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 Europe and US there still uh, there is a fantastic uh, collection system. Although there is a lack of uh, uh, segregation uh, or or sorting of 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 these uh, garments and goods. but at least there's a well established collection systems uh, which which collect different type of waste and 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 uh, buckets them so i think there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, work that needs to be ha- needs to happen for this and also how to collaboratively bring this back to the uh, to the textile system and not to down cycle it and take it out to any other industry or, or system so uh, i would say this is the big opportunity and i know uh, you definitely you you working on 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 uh, uh, giving some formal shape to it at least in some part but i think the the the, the uh, opportunity is so large that we need a uh, very broad based collaboration and i would say also pre competitive collaboration so maybe even several manufacturers coming together to collaborate or several brands coming together to collaborate uh, would be would be an ideal pathway fantastic um and and i love that right so if that concrete one concrete area where there is a significant opportunity to one of course you know make progress towards sustainability but also an area where um which is one of our biggest mandates as cif which is to bring together a coalition of partners and and galvanizing collective action um for our benefit help us understand what would a successful collaboration in the space of waste management stroke recycling look like right so when you said 
we could have a bunch of manufacturers coming together and forming a consortium. What would be one way in which we could bring these together? And what would that successful collaboration look like? Uh, it, could, it could be at a 20,000 feet view, but what would that collaboration or a, the successful collaboration look like uh, in that space, Abhishek? Yeah, so if, if I take a very optimistic uh, scenario, uh, Venkar, then as you know, like we, we see a lot of new startups and technologies which have cracked uh, the code for, for recycling of used textiles. So uh, although at pilot scale and, and lab scale, we see that some of these technologies are just simply able to take uh, the used garment and then uh, uh, dissolve it or reprocess it to make uh, brand new fibers which are not, not very uh, very different from the, their fiber qualities than some of the fibers which are used as virgin fibers. So why, uh, why can't we have a system where uh, like some of these technologies can be scaled here in India with the help of few like-minded say, manufacturers or brand who can all input into this as a, as, a, as a feedstock of waste and then also everybody take output from there. Uh, as, as recycled fibers or recycled materials because this is a problem which is too big for uh, an individual or a single organization to solve and, and some of these plants are also uh, uh, at scale and at the scale of economy would be very large so uh, and a third point is that the technology risk and risk of failure is also very high so that some of these things are ideal uh, for making a collaboration where everything can be split. split. So you split the risk, you split the rewards, uh, and you split the benefits and investments and try to make uh, something work by committing the feedstock and also committing the offtake, which could be sort of one quick way to, uh, to scale uh, some of the technology that we see is working in pilot or in lab scale. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Uh, so I'm conscious that we've got about five minutes left, uh, Abhishek. Uh, before we move on towards the end, and um, while you talk about the other two calls to action or areas for collaboration, potential collaboration uh, between the enterprises, startups, and innovators could uh, collaborate with Arvind on, while you're talking about that, I'm just going to quickly scan through the chat to see what other interesting questions uh, we could have from the audience to you. But uh, please do talk about the other two calls to action that you had. Sure, and uh, I think the, the primary one and where uh, some of our largest energies are focused right now is sustainable manufacturing. So how we totally transform the textile manufacturing of yesterday in coming five, 10 years is, is something that's of deep interest, whether it is in terms of uh, dyeing, whether it's in terms of finishing, whether it's in, it's in terms of waste reduction. And what we've seen uh, like so far, uh, the focus has always been on uh, incremental uh, approach where we see that uh, incrementally we say, okay, 10, 15, 20% of energy or water or, or raw material or chemicals. And this is something uh, we, we, uh, we take it as, as a new step or a new innovation. But we are now looking at uh, the technologies and, and the future where things will be done drastically differently than they used to be in, in, in textile industry of today or yesterday. So we are on lookout for such innovation which can move the needle by shifting or by reducing one of the input materials by more than 35-40%. So we are on a lookout for technologies which can reduce say 40% water for dyeing uh, textile or processing textile, or it can reduce 40% chemicals or 40, 50% energy. So we are at, we're trying to shift from more incremental approach to a radical approach where we, we completely change uh, the way uh, production happens. And we've implemented some of these technologies already over the past uh, two, three years. We are now, uh, one of the primary uh, or, or the best example could be foam dyeing of denim. 
where we have uh, we uh, deployed a technology last year where denim is dyed using indigo foam instead of large troughs of water where uh, where the yarn or, or is dipped and then and, and taken out for several baths. So you save about 80, 90 right. percent. Uh, energy and chemicals in that. So we are on look, look out for more and more uh, such technologies, uh, of course, which which makes or uh, which reduces uh, for uh, reduces drastically reduces the impact. And second, of course, is uh, uh, how we can uh, make uh, lives easier in, in the current crisis and for future by using more and more digital solutions. So what? other digital solutions that could aid uh, businesses uh, in doing something that we were used to do in pre-COVID world and uh, doing it more sustainably now through the use of digitization, which can possibly perpetuate even after uh, like sort of COVID crisis. And so we don't want to shift to something in, in the short term or medium term, but we would look for solutions where uh, say digital sampling or digital uh, display or digital digitally sending your collections and garments uh, to brands or, or or how to make lives easier for consumers b2b as well as b2c uh, by use of digital solutions and there are many out there which we are evaluating but uh, we will certainly be open for more uh, and, and we are looking for more permanent changes uh, to the business with the help of digitization fantastic no, thank you so much for that, Abhishek. Um, before we let you go, and we've hit um, right on the hour, but I do have a couple of questions left, Abhishek, and these are very, very quick. Um, quick words of advice for the enterprises, the innovators, or the brands and retailers who have uh, logged in and listening to you. Some quick words of advice on how to persevere and continue to work on keeping the sustainability agenda alive within their own organizations. I think, uh, as we probably touched upon, it's uh, it's uh, it's quite essential to involve people across the breadth of your organization first, and uh, to involve your end consumers. So I think. Uh, internal buy-in is a must. So across levels, uh, one should try and, and convince people on the importance of the initiative that you're trying to take on sustainability. And I think it, it, it doesn't uh, help to shrink sort of your sphere uh, in, in, in the beginning if you're just uh, starting out. So just start with one or two uh, different things and not like 10 different things immediately and, and build, build a strong strategy and focus around that. And involving or communicating about it uh, to to your consumer and also getting uh, their support is 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 very very handy uh, for perpetuating some of these initiatives in the longer term. Fantastic. Um, couldn't have agreed more that it's about getting more and more people. And I think while we talk about the whole shift and transition towards circularity, also having to be inclusive and distributive the whole effort also needs to be inclusive and i think there's a lot more progress that can be had that can be made uh, there's a lot more uh, credible movement forward as an industry as an ecosystem that can be made if we bring in more people into the conversation and into the effort than trying to do it alone fantastic i uh, couldn't uh, agree more with you um my favorite questions from if you had to put your lens as an individual, as somebody who's been driving the sustainability agenda um, on at an industry level. Two questions. One, what do you think is working despite all the odds and challenges? And two, what do you think is not working despite all the efforts? Where do we see the opportunity? And to me, those are both are opportunity areas, right? Which is what's working despite all the challenges and odds and what's not working in spite of all the efforts. Where do you think we are from an industry standpoint? Yeah, I think what what uh, is still working is uh, innovation, I would say. So if, if even right now, if we are able to, if we take a new product to consumer, to our B2C, for example, I'm talking in the context of manufacturing, and if yeah. we take a uh, few products to our uh, brand customers, 
and those are innovative in, in uh, to the extent of reducing the environmental impact there's immediate attention that you will get uh, from from the customers if you have impacts that are quantifiable that are credible so if if right. uh, I, I think some of the technologies uh, and measures that we have implemented say on foam dyeing uh, which drastically reduces the water consumption and chemical consumption. So this is still a huge traction. And if we are still uh, going with another new idea of say say dyeing, which is based on uh, say natural dyeing or or any other uh, alternative or new material, which is way less impact. So all these ideas and products are still uh, uh, they still pull a lot of consumers uh, interest uh, in, in our view and in our experience but at the same time what still doesn't work is uh, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately is that uh, willingness to pay more uh, for for a sustainable outcome so we are still seeing a lot of hesitation in paying a premium for uh, for a more sustainable product or a more sustainable outcome so, so there's still uh, uh, a challenge of convincing end consumer, or in our case, our B two C consumers, to pay uh, pay a uh, more uh, a higher price if if uh, the if the product takes more to make or, or or so on. So we are still looking for technologies which can dramatically change uh, uh, change the game in terms of their environmental impact, but uh, the products should still remain competitively tried. So that's a key, uh, slightly lower, I would say, uh, bandwidth in terms of the whole spectrum of things that are available. But that's something that's a quick win, sells easily, and, and delivers the impact also. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Uh, any final words or if I can stick my neck out and say this, but anything that you would love to pose a question to CIF on an area that you would want us to solve for at an ecosystem or at an industry level? Uh, I think at the sake of repeating, of course, waste is something which is an unsolved challenge. And I think if we can convert waste to recycling uh, and bring it back uh, to textile stream, that's uh, perhaps the biggest uh, 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 goal uh, that that uh, we can achieve, and also uh, how to build more partnerships. We see uh, in India we lack uh, a platform uh, which is like a local platform for the textile apparel brand industry. There's not, uh, although we we have like a lot of associations and 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 uh, collaborations and so on, but we don't have anything which is working at scale with a lot of diverse stakeholders on sustainability as a subject. So if if somebody can can convene uh, that as a group or we have that going uh, in India, I think that would also help a lot. Fantastic. Love the challenge and uh, uh, obviously good that you know we've already started work and in collaboration with you guys. So hopefully we'll get to a solution that works for you and that works for the industry as such. Uh, 